Hey, I'm Rachel Billingsley. And I'm Luke Billingsley, and this is GMT Talk, our new insider podcast where we talk about all things GMT. Today on GMT Talk, we'll be interviewing Fred Serval and Joe Dewhurst, the dynamic duo. Fred has designed one game published by GMT, Red Flag Over Paris, and one game currently on GMT's P500 list, Adjust of Robin Hood. And Joe is one of GMT's staff developers, and he has two of his own designs currently on the P500 list. The Pure Land, which is Coin Series Volume 14, and Resisting Revolution, which is an expansion for Cuba Libre. Joe and Fred, thanks for being here. Hey, Hi. thanks for having us. Welcome. So we were, uh, we were episode number how many? That's the question. Two, I think. Mm. Three? I think, well, three or four. It depends on how... I'm, I feel, I feel, actually, I feel hurt by that. I, I think we should have been episode one, probably. Maybe two. I would have been okay with two. Episode four, that's pushing it. I, I'm a bit sad. <laughs> you have three people more interesting than us to come to the show before. What, what happened here? Like, who are episode one, two, and three? I want to know now. I want answers. Yeah, you won't be happy to hear about episode one. <laughs> <laughs> Harold. Harold got the spotlight first. Oh, God. He doesn't deserve it. And he knows it. That's why he's so spiteful. Yeah. Well, we didn't want to make you feel too important, so you know. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah, but Drew does that on a, a yeah. Drew does that on a daily basis, so you, you... <laughs> we gotta keep the egos Good. in check. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Fred, you and I uh, worked on Red Flag over Paris together, as well as Joe and Jason and a bunch of other people. But it seems fitting to start there. It had a great first printing, sold out, and it was added to the reprint list last year. Is there anything about Red Flag Over Paris that you'd want to talk about? Anything coming up? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think one thing that is coming up and probably would be out probably at around the time when this episode will be out is uh, a variant and an expansion in C3i magazine. Um because the game had a life of its own after its release. Uh, there was a lot of people playing it. There was a lot of interaction with player. And I thought there was an opportunity for me to bring in new things, either things that I had left thinking about but didn't integrate in the last version of the game because I kept thinking about it even once it was released. And for those of who um, who watch Homo Ludens might have seen this, I had a design rule with Mark Herman where we played Fort Sumter and then we played Red Flag over Paris to see who was the best player. Obviously, I am the best player uh, by a long shot. Like, there is no no question here. Uh, I crushed him on his own game and on my own game, so that was really fun. But uh, more importantly, at the end of the discussion, we were talking about that variant. So if you go back there, you would see the, the beginning of the thinking of that variant. Uh, Mark and I talking about the limits of the um, uh, system and... I was thinking about a way for a while about expanding it, but I wanted to talk to Mark about it to see what was his thought because Mark is, I think, is really sharp, both as a designer but also about the mathematical aspects of it. Um, and and there was clearly a math problem uh, around uh, how to expand a bit um, uh, the possibilities of the game while retaining the same level of complexity uh, and also reducing the amount of luck because games uh, you just have cards to see through the whole game really system like this um and yeah it came from this uh there was some events that i wanted to have in the main deck that i couldn't have originally so it was the opportunity for me uh when roger reached out and said oh i would like to publish some extra content for red flag over paris um donald and i worked on it donald awesome as usual always ready to do something for fun uh like this Mm -hmm. and yeah we made we made 10 extra cards uh, to expand a bit on the history of the paris commune talk about stuff that uh, weren't in the original deck um quite a few things the vandom column uh which is something that i left aside and i wanted to talk about um and more cards that play with that bends the rules of the game also i wanted to do a bit more of this because i felt like i was very careful in the original version of the game with most of the events not pushing too far what an event can do and just a few that were a bit more creative and those 10 cards all of them are or or pushing uh, the, the limits a bit of the of the system and uh, yeah, and this variant with new player aids and everything. So that was also a nice way for me to thank all of the people who bought the game because I didn't expect it to go out of stock that fast. And I thought it would be fun to keep on 
uh, releasing stuff around Red Flag Over Paris, also for people to keep engaging with the game because it's a rather short game. And I think that it's mm -hmm. nice to have ways to re-explore it and, and play uh, with it a bit more uh, and adding some content. So um, most of the stuff have already been available for free on BGG, uh, but the version that you have in C3i is refined, you could say, because we had some feedbacks uh, on 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 from players that actually uh, integrated uh, with like print and play uh, the expansion to their game. And it was, yeah, just made some adjustments uh, on this. And when it's out, we should have the digital implementation of it within Rally the Troops. So the censorship variant was already in there from the get-go. That's also something that we discussed with Star because I think feel that the game is uh, a better design with that variant. But it didn't contain the extra cards. I wanted them to be released by C3i first and then integrating them as an event uh, within Rally the Troops. So that's what's up with Red Flag Over Paris. I don't think that I will keep on releasing new content about it in the future, not anytime soon. Maybe in the future, but not not now. I have other stuff to do. But I thought it was nice uh, within the first year to actually keep working on it and releasing new stuff for for the people who who are enjoying the game. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll be looking forward to that coming out in C3i soon. Yeah, me yes. too. Uh... I hope you'll enjoy it. Let me know once you try it. But yeah, each time someone tells me, oh, I've played Red Flag Over Paris, the first question I ask, and I'm, it's almost annoying. It's like, have you tried the censorship yeah. variant? Because it's a... Uh... But Joe, you would nobody, agree. Nobody has, any, nobody has any idea what you're talking about. It's just a random person no. on the street, and they say, oh, fuck the hell. I loved your game. And you say, have you tried the censorship variant? And then they start crying. Yes. Huh? It's horrible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I don't want to yeah, I cannot enjoy it. It's like if you haven't played the real game, that's the thing. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's I'm a bit like a madman. Yeah. Always asking, have you played the censorship bar? Have you played the but censorship bar? The variant, um, we should say, is also available to download on the P500 page for the reprint. So there, there's a version yes. of it there. Yeah. And, we, and we can probably update that once the C3i1 comes out as, as well, just yeah. in case there's yeah. any important differences. But it's it's a pretty simple variant. Um, you, you can, you know, once, once you learn it, it's very easy to integrate into the game. And you would agree, Joe, that it is it makes the game significantly better with just uh, like a couple of lines of rules uh, additionally. I think it makes it slightly uh, more yeah. elegant and also, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a that's lot good. better person. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I think it helped. Um, <laughs> yeah. You see, this is what I have to deal with. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. lack of enthusiasm. Like, no, no, I, 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 think it, I, think it, I think it does improve the game. I think, <laughs> I think it does improve the game. Yeah, um, but I, I played the game so much that it's hard to tell from time. Um, yeah. You know, you get to this point where, where you can't really tell what, what's happening anymore. But, right. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that. Uh, but I, you're designing a lot more stuff. Uh, just a Robin Hood's coming up, so yeah. we wanted to know what inspired you to design a game about the folk hero, Robin Hood. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it's kind of Joe's fault, actually. Um, it all started uh, during the uh, during the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, I was quite bored, uh, and I got into. I heard about the Discord server. I wasn't even using Discord back then, and there was a Discord server with a lot of players that were playing only coin games. Uh, and it was a so small server at the time. I think when I joined, it was a few hundred people there, um, uh, something like this. Um, and I started uh, playing coin a lot more before then. I was a bit lukewarm about the coin system. Uh, I only played games two player like almost exclusively, and I didn't feel like coin was an interesting two player game. And I hadn't played um, uh, that much of uh, Colonial Twilight. I was mostly playing with the person I was playing at the time, uh, which is who's another uh, uh, GMT designer. I, I was just living next door to him, which was quite fortunate, uh, Brian S. Um And we we're just living next to each other in Vida. Uh, and yeah, pl playing the two of us, playing four-player coin games was, was not super interesting. But then I got into that Discord server and I started uh, meeting with a lot of young players that were really into coin, high-level uh, coin players. And it was a way for me to discover the system in a new light mostly through the digital uh, realm. Uh, and uh, I got really excited about the system. And then I got to test a game that I thought was amazing. And I was like, whoa, the system is just great. And this game was the pure land. And it was just a prototype. Uh, and I was really amazed. And I was I didn't expect that um, a coin game could do this, could call about, could talk about 
uh, peasantry economics, uh, like having that many layers, the fact that you had two counterinsurgent fight, uh, factions fighting against each other, the impact that it has on the land. Like I felt it was really making a strong and compelling point about uh, civil war uh, and, and also talking about the economical aspects of it. And I was just, yeah, um, I think it was really uh, the game that really made me realize what coin had to offer. Uh, and then I played more and more coin games, um, and I realized that there was a lot of them that I actually quite enjoyed, up to the point where I realized that maybe one of my favorite one was End the Abyss, the, the first one. Not my all-time favorite, but after playing most of them, or, yeah, I think the only one I haven't played is Pandragon yet, and <laughs> Morgan is going to be upset. <laughs> but, uh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I, I will play it. Uh, it's just that it's the most complex and the most uh, involved one, and I, I would like to play the physical copy. I did, but anyway, um, looking at this, I looking back at the Nebes, I thought there was so many good ideas already in there, and maybe stuff that we didn't uh, give the game credit for because it was overshadowed by everything that was released after. But anyway, I got really into the coin system, and the thing is that I realized that probably coin games could be played by a lot more players than the players that were playing it at the time. I think it was um, a very narrow niche, uh, mostly either like core GMT audience war gamers that were not maybe the biggest fan of fans of the coin system. And then some new players that were maybe hardcore gamers in other categories that really found something in coin that they liked. But I felt like it could have a bigger audience than that. Um, and in a lot of ways, Root was, uh, is, was doing this. Uh, and I think that Root is probably one of the best games that was released in the last decade. So it's not like I could change anything about this, but the issue that I had with Root, and issue is a big word. Uh, it's really a great game. It does bring the ideas or the ethos, the ethos of coin to a wider audience, but it doesn't introduce people to the coin series. Like if you've played Root, you don't know how to play a coin game. You might learn that it's inspired by the coin system, that it shares a lot of ideas and everything, but it doesn't introduce to it. And I was in that situation where I started working with GMT. Uh, I realized it was like my publisher of hearts like uh, like the, the place where i wanted to make the games that matter to me um and after red flag over paris i was thinking well i would like to make another game with uh gmt and one of the things that i wanted to do at that time was a bit of a love letter to the coin series and creating a tool that would make people um get into the series and realize its full potential and for me making a game for this needed to resolve quite a few issues the first of one was limiting the, the footprint, so both the complexity, the length, the space that it takes, um, uh, but also limiting its complexity, uh, making sure that it was not too complex to get into. Even if I don't think that coin games are necessarily the most complex games that you can play, they have a lot of subtlety. The fact that you have four factions can be quite a lot to handle. And the other thing that I wanted to find is the other, the final hurdle that I saw was the themes. Of course, not everyone wants to spend six hours uh, playing the war in Afghanistan, which is fair. Uh, and sure. yeah, so I had this in the back of my mind. I wanted to do something about this, not really knowing what to do. And then one day I wrote a, I, I read an article by Rodney Hilton, which was um, uh, a British medieval historian um, that wrote an article in the in the mid fifties that was. Um, drawing a parallel between um, Robin Hood and the Merriman and the Cuban Barbudos, uh, so the, the revolutionaries in Cuba, and saying, well, in a lot of ways, we can see a lot of parallels between uh, those bandits uh, that uh, transposed in our time, we would call terrorists, uh, that are fighting actually on oppression and 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 fighting for, for the peasants. And when I read those lines, I was like, okay, that I never thought about it this way, but thinking about Robin Hood as a charismatic leader and the Merry Men as a form of proto-guerrilla made a lot of sense. And I was like, well, if that's the case, I can make the simplest coin game possible where you have the counterinsurgent that is the sheriff and the insurgent that are the Merry Men. Just make a game around this and make it light, uh, short, and with a theme that will speak to everyone. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the whole uh, story behind how this game came to be uh, in a nutshell. That's awesome. I love that. And uh, it all started with the Pure Land. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always forget that that's when we first met, actually. Um, I had no idea who this guy Fred was. Everyone else <laughs> in the world knows him, of course. He's, he's a famous uh, YouTube personality. And You're making a joke, but the, the, the people in the playtest knew who I was. Like, they're I know, they were like, what? Yeah. This, this guy, this, I'm, I'm in awe of this guy. And I thought, who's this, who's this guy? 
what's yes. he doing in my game? Um, and then that was it. Uh, yeah. History was the made. First time we went, we, yeah. we met for this playtest of pure Yeah. My next question, I've heard about the Traveler's deck, but I have not played the game. And I'm not familiar with it. So could you tell me a little bit about what it is and how it's used? Yeah, sure. So originally it was a cheat pool system. Um, and it, the idea came from the uh, 1970s uh, SPI game on Robin Hood. Uh, because when I make a game, I like to play games about the topic to see how things were approached in different ways. Uh, and I played a few Robin Hood games. I played the Sheriff of Nottingham, where like it's a bluffing game, like almost a party game. I played that, uh, and I loved it. Uh, and I played this SPI uh, game from the 70s. And I think that's pretty much it. I know that Worthington had released the game, but it was a block game, and I didn't really see the purpose of how they were approaching the topic, and I decided not to play it because it, it didn't make a lot of sense with what I wanted to do. And there was also this uh, big German Euro game with a big storytelling element that was released at around the time when I started uh, that I also played. I don't remember its name. I think it might just be Robin Hood. I don't know. Uh, but it was a big thing in 2020, 2019. Um, and originally, I wanted just to have a randomizer for travelers that you might encounter in Nottinghamshire. Uh, and you had this cheat pool system. And when encounter. you encounter and then, yeah. and, and rob and rob, yeah, mostly, yeah, you encounter them first, yeah, before robbing them. But basically, <laughs> you are in the roads as the Merriman and Robin Hood, and you just drag uh, a, a, a counter and then and then you check, um. Uh, who, it, who it is you're meeting, or they're monks, or they're merchants, or they're knights, or any anything. Uh, and that was basically the system, and they had a small strength value, and they had some money. And the more uh, the design developed, the more I thought, well, actually, from a small homage to an old 70s game from SPI, I could actually make that evolve into a more fully-fledged mechanic that could actually bring a lot more narrative elements, because I was thinking about how can I bring narrative elements within the game, because it's a game about stories, um, really importantly. And I thought, OK, what are the different ways that I could do that? And this Traveler deck was just here. And I was like, well, this cheat pool system could become just a draw deck where you would draw and you would get an actual more fully fledged encounter where you have multiple options, where you can make decisions. And you can decide, importantly, what type, what type of bandit do you want to be? How violent do you want to oppose um, existing hierarchies that are uh, around you as a, as an insurgent? And I thought that was an interesting decision space for the player, both strategically but also narratively. And yeah, I decided to develop this a lot more. So you have generic travelers that you can meet, uh, monks, uh, knights, travelers. You also have uh, characters that are from the ballads. Uh, so you can meet Richard at the Lee, much the Miller Sun, for example. And then you've got some event in the main deck because the main deck is the same that in uh, in regular coin games that actually trigger a change in the traveler deck so you can have new characters coming in uh that so the deck will be uh developed over time and basically yeah that became that that whole mechanic and that whole idea and each time you encounter someone you have two options a more light one like uh, where you're a bit more playful and you take a bit of money but you're not too brutal and then a darker one that goes back to maybe more who the character war was originally, a bit more brutal, especially with uh, the monks or with the knights, and really challenging the hierarchies of the time and like being physically violent. But it comes at more risks. Uh, it goes, uh, but you have higher rewards, but also the risks are higher. Um, basically, yeah, the, the level of violence might uh, turn against you. Um, so that's yeah. a decision that you have to make along the game. There's this nice thing which you, you briefly mentioned that a lot of the, the travels we have in the deck actually relate to some of the older ballads and they often call things like Robin Hood and the Monk or Robin Hood yes. and the Merchant or something like this. So it's so so it's very much like when you draw one of these travelers, you're you're encountering um, a small part of one of these older older ballads. You kind of older uh, tales. Living yeah. that. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. I love how you changed it from the chits to the deck to add more narrative into the game. And I would say this to designers, if you have an idea and it relies around cheat pool, it could always be better if you made a deck of cards. <laughs> like and then, they, then those, cards, those cards got bigger and bigger as well. They, they yes, kept getting I, larger. I, another, another they, and, and, and Joe had to stop me because they wouldn't fit in the box anymore. Like It was literally yeah. small posters for each of them. It was like, that's too much. <laughs> uh yeah. and yeah so we settled for tarot cards which is a bit boring but fair enough it's the biggest i could fit in the box and i'm happy with that yep. 
We should tell that to uh, Gene about Mr. President that the whole system is too boring and needs to make it too boring. <laughs> and you know what? He would think about it. He would say, "I'm right," and he would make a variant. That's what I. I, I that's my promise to you. You'll see, Mr. President, two would be fully uh, deck controlled. It's going to be three hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, it would be worth yeah. it. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. We've actually joked about um, selling uh, small expansion packs, like like booster packs, like you get with trading card games. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so you could buy a buy a little pack of new travelers, and you know, oh, you might get a, sh a shiny Gear of Gizmo yes. or something. And yeah. That would be that would be a really a really rare card. But I'm not quite sure that's GMT's model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not exactly. Uh, but we, we could change the model. Yeah. We can add like a small yeah. sets of cards that you can add to the main deck. Small sales of sets of travelers. I think it would be awesome. Uh, think about it. Yeah. Talk to I mean, Gene. People, yeah. yeah, people are <laughs> with uh, 300, so let's yeah. see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I'm looking forward to Jess of Robin Hood a lot. That sounds super fun. And I think you said you wanted it to be more accessible, right? More kind of entry level, a simplified version of coin. That would be perfect for me because I've never been into coin really either. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. And the, the topic is on point and the the narrative elements sound great too. So maybe it'll be my first and favorite coin game. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I hope it won't be your favorite, which might sound weird. I hope it would be your point of entry and then you'll find your favorite coin game, which I think is out there. Uh, and for me, my favorite coin game, we already talked about it. It's the pure land. That's my favorite coin game. But yeah, but uh, <laughs> but you'll find you'll find your coin game. Yeah. Hopefully, some people will think that this one is their favorite. I hope so, but it's not the intent to make your uh, to make a favorite con game. I like that. That's a good point. So, speaking of the Pure Land, Joe, what is the current status? Where are you in the the project right now? Uh, so, the current status now in mid December is that we're still 2023. Is that we're still waiting or still moving ahead with the earlier. Um, games in the volume so there's a bit of a kind of a pipeline thing where we're trying to finish up red dust rebellion which will be volume 12 and then china's war which will be volume 13 and i'm pretty central to both those projects now um so i'm working uh, as we speak pretty much on getting red dust rebellion finished through art um then china's war um but then the good news with the pure land is it's 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 pretty much all done as well so that's that's ready to go as soon as we get to that point in, in the series so it'll be a quick a quick jump and we've actually just started looking for an artist for the map now so that's something which will hopefully uh, start moving on soon. And I've got some very interesting ideas for the map, which uh, Fred's, Fred's seen as well. So some, some ideas about how to theme it around some of the kind of historical content in the game, but also the uh, Buddhist content, which is kind of in, in the name of the game, as I could, I could talk about it. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we haven't found the artist yet, but I'm hoping we can find someone who can do something really interesting with that theme. So Fred said earlier something about the peasants in the game. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that that was a very, from an early point in my thinking about the design, that was something I really wanted to emphasize. Um, and basically that's that there are these, these peasants all across the map. This is a, a civil war in um, 15th century Japan. Um, and these peasants are going to be uh, used by all the other factions. So they're, they're kind of like a resource, like you might have a, um, you know, just, just a value in a province, which you can harvest in, in other games, but they're actually a physical piece. And then when you use them in some way, they might they might join your army. So you might strip them into your army, or you might trigger a peasant, peasant uprising. Um, they become kind of active fighting on your side, or you might just take some, some resources from them. Um, and, and there's one faction who are more closely aligned with the peasants, but it would be a mistake to say they're the peasant faction. They're just the ones who um, use the peasants most often. And, and everyone else is going to be using the peasants in, in, in different mm. ways. And, and control of these peasants becomes a really key part of the game. I think probably ignored earlier on in the game by some players. And then halfway through, they'll realize they've got no peasants left. And they don't have any, any money in their armies or anything like this. Mm. Um, but it also leads to some interesting dynamics, which I was very gratified to find out fitted well with the... Uh, historical strategies when I did some more further research. Like, for instance, if you're worried about a peasant uprising in one of your provinces, you might conscript all the peasants into your army and march them off somewhere else. And this is more or less what, what some of the warlords in the, in the slightly later era would quite explicitly think about doing. So it was it was a useful way to, to stop people being angry at your heavy taxation was just to force them to join your army instead and wow. then send them off to fight. Um, so yeah, it's, it's this really core part of the game. And um, I I went through a few different iterations of how to how to do it. So at one point I had um, 
lots of uh, lots of tiny chits, like like in Pendragon, to show different states of peasants. But uh, that was way too messy. Sorry, sorry, Morgan. So we decided not to do this in the end. Um, but but they have a kind of a, a similar role in some ways to the prosperity cubes in Pendragon. Um, if if anyone knows that, and and that's that's one that was one of my inspirations, and, and that was actually one of the first coin games I, I played. So that that idea of having a kind of literal representation of the economic factors um, on the board was something I got from, from that game. Um, and yeah, then then it carried through to these peasants who, who are really the part of the game, even though they're not um, any one of the individual player factions, but they're there and, and used and interacted with with everyone else. Um, and and like Fred said, it, it emphasizes. I guess the kind of human human cost and human involvement of this very bloody civil war, um, and I, I hope makes people think about that m more. So you know they're they're not just fighting quite abstractly for control of the country; they're they're using and, and hurting these these peasants uh, who are involved in it all the time. Yeah. And just to to build on that, I think this is probably one of the the thing that on personally I've been a bit more frustrated with the coin series about, and that's the the lack of. Um, the high level of abstraction of, of the impact on civilian population of those conflicts, um, because it represents mostly uh, civil wars. Civil wars are extremely costly on uh, civilian population. And I feel like just a, a terror chit is, is probably not much. I think it's great that it's already there. It's already a lot more than most war games that exist out there. But I, I felt like for the topic that it was addressing, um, it was always a bit uh, lacking for 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 me, even though I love the series. And I think what Joe did, uh, first of all, he, he, gave, he gave some form of agency to the peasant, which was uh, also quite refreshing. Like the fact that you can have peasant revolt is is something that um, uh, speaks to me uh, uh, quite a lot. But also like sh showing that human cost of well, when you're uh, creating an army, they don't come from nowhere. It does have an impact on the records that you're going to have, and everything is interconnected and has that more materialistic approach to what is the civil war and what kind of impact it has on the economy and its people. And I feel it really showed that using the same framework as the as the coin series, you could show more things. And that's what uh, compelled me that much with that game, I think, I uh, was doing, yeah. Yeah. And one, I mean, one, one brief thing about how it fits in with the history is uh, one, one of the factions is called the, the Koiki, which translates as for the pure, the, the single-minded league. So they have, you know, they're, they're a league who have just one, one goal, but there were lots of these ickies or, or leagues mm. all, all across the country. So they would be groups of peasants and often, you know, lower level nobles as well, or higher level merchants who were kind of angry about taxation or about some other thing. And they band together and they come up with some kind of declaration and say, you know, we, we don't want this to happen. We don't want that to happen. So there's all, all of these peasant revolts represent one of these smaller kind of icky leagues. And they'd sometimes do things, this is the middle of a civil war where there's armies marching to and forth. They'd, they'd sometimes just say, no, no armies are allowed in our territory. You know, it isn't even that they mind about paying taxes or anything. They just don't want to be, to be bothered. Um, so there's, there's lots of these different things represented here by, by the different peasant groups. Um, and that's just a point that I'm personally very interested in. I think it's very interesting to look at these more kind of common, common level uh, goings on during civil wars. Yeah. That's really interesting, especially having them as the base of the economic system in the game. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, they're really core cool to it. Um, and it, I mean, it, it, it becomes a very fierce economic game, I think, by the end. Fred, Fred will be able to say more, having, having played it. But often by the end of the game, it really does come down to who can keep control of enough, enough resources to be yeah. even doing anything. And that's what happened with this. So this was a 10-year civil war, roughly, but by about halfway through, it, uh, you know, really it just stalled because nobody could attraction to do anything anymore um, it just wrecked the whole country and uh, people couldn't do anything so so it that kind of happens in the game and it can become uh, quite quite important to have more peasants in your territory basically i'm interested in the art for the game you mentioned that you're looking for a, an artist for the map right now and maybe the box cover tell me a little bit about the font even that you've chosen already and yeah, the, the, get yeah. some different images and kind of your perspective on how you want to portray the theme and the period through the art. So for the cloud images, I, I'd like to use as many kind of roughly period images like, as I can, although that will probably have to be a more expansive idea of what the period is. So it might need to be some, some later art kind of about the era because it's, not, it's, a, it's a more obscure period and there's not that much art about. Um, but I, I really want to try and carry through um, so that, that kind of period feel. So I was saying to Fred that the board could look maybe 
like a board from a few centuries later but about the era so you know from history or from um even a board game somebody in the 16th century made about this this war or something like this um but but with this kind of very you know period japanese uh, look to it um and, and the other thing i'd like to incorporate both into the board and into the, the clever and the cards is more of the, the buddhist imagery as well so title the pure land uh refers to this um and, you know, very roughly speaking, Buddhist heaven in uh, in this, this kind of Buddhism, um, Pure Land Buddhism, um, and one of the factions is is a kind of uh, Buddhist, um, well, new, newish Buddhist faith who has this particular idea about what what this theology is. Um, so there's and there's there's almost a pun there where it's about the Pure Land, but really there's this really horrible war going on on, on Earth, but there's this kind of of a realm that people might, might try for. And there's lots of interesting imagery about this, which I think it would be interesting to include, you know, around the board or around the cards or on, on the cover somehow as well. Um, that, that's what I have kind of in mind for that. And I've done a bit of research into what, what that might look like. Um, but the font I'm using uh, is an interesting one because I was looking for a font which would convey some of the setting, um, but not in a kind of a crass way. So there's sometimes these quite crude orientalist ideas you know like like the chopstick font or something of what uh Chinese or Japanese font might be um and I found this font uh called the Hasegawa font which is actually from the 19th century and it's a 19th century um printing typeface so you know for old ink printers uh which is meant to be easier to read if you're used to Japanese um symbol drawing uh reading rather than Western characters, uh, letters, um, and it, so it's designed by by a Japanese printer with this in mind. Um, and I I just thought that was a very interesting concept. So it's it's a you know it's a Western Roman typeface, but to present um, that kind of font in a way that might be easier to understand if you're used to a different kind of script. Um, and and it and it's very kind of carefully chosen with a certain kind of aesthetic as well. So that's um, what what I will need to try and do for the final product is get in contact with the modern designer of that font who's made a, made a digital version and, and see if we can use it, which I'm not sure about yet. Gotcha. That's really cool, though. I love yeah, that. hopefully we can. Yeah, it's a really yeah, cool. Yeah, really great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so would you say that this is a good intro game to the series? And if not, how difficult is it like versus some of the other ones? Me, me and Fred will disagree about this. <laughs> um, I Well, we'll... We'll agree that it's not necessarily a good intro, and we'll agree about this as well, though, which is that the best intro to the coin series is whichever topic you're most interested in. Yes. Um, that probably means this isn't a good intro because nobody's ever heard of this war in Europe or in, in, in the West. Um, but people like the Japanese historical theme, so that might draw some people in. Um, I So Fred's going to say it's not a good intro. I, I agree it's not a good intro. I don't think it's as complicated as Fred might think it is. Um, I actually think if you're completely new to war games or to the coin series, it's it's probably about the the middle of the complexity scale of the coin series. Okay. If you've played a lot of the other games like Ande and Abyss and so on, it will be higher complexity because it's quite different to those. But it's not as high complexity, for instance, as as Pendragon or as Red Dust Rebellion, which will also have wider popular appeal. Um, it's probably similar to a distant plane, maybe a little below Fire on the Lake, I would say. So so it's really in the middle of the series, but it's going to be harder for people who are already used to the series to kind of switch into the new ways mm. it works, um, mm. I would say. And there's some, but so the bit which people find tricky at first is there's a slightly abstract relationship between um, what I call the social geography of the map. So there's there's the peasants to start with, but there's also the, the different clan loyalties. And in this period, it was a bit like um, the Holy Roman Empire in Europe. So you would have one, one clan or one family who might own some territory there, some territory here, all over the place. Kind of not not with any particular sensible logic to it, and this comes across in the game a bit. So you might earn the loyalty of a clan, and that helps you over here and down here at the same time. Um, so that gives a, a kind of abstract layer to the map, which can be a bit uh, complicated sometimes to grasp. Um, but once once that clicks, I think it's very easy, and that's probably the most complex part of it. Does that seem yeah. fair, Fred? Yeah, I think it's fair. So I agree that the level of complexity of the game is probably in the middle high range. I don't think it's as complex as Fire in the Lake. Uh, and I think that's fair. And Fire in the Lake can be your intro into the coin series if you are a big fan or very interested uh, in the um, in the Vietnam War. So I, I think that's that's fair. I I do believe that the the 
So there is different types of complexity in games, and I think the spatial complexity of this game is actually quite high because of what Joe was talking about. The fact that you can control, but the loyalty is different, that you have to map the loyalty on the loyalty track and make it make sense on the board itself is actually... Like there is a lot uh, to it that you have to think about uh, beyond just knowing what your faction does, what the other faction does, what are the faction dynamics between them, which is the classical con game. You also have that spatial complexity that is um, on top of something that is already quite complex. So I would say definitely not the easiest game in the series. There is this part of some people or, and, I, and I've seen different people playing the game. Some people click really fast with that loyalty system and that's fine for them. I think some people are really gonna be challenged by that because different brains react in different ways to different types of complexity. Some people are like really great with mathematical problems, but then as soon as it's a bit more spatial, it becomes more complex to them. And we all um, integrate complexity in different ways. And I think for in that regard, the pure land has more layers of different types of complexity to them, mm -hmm. which makes it quite unique in terms of complexity. So that's why I would say it's probably not the best way to get into the coin system. Also, because it's somewhat different from most of the other coin games. Like as Joe was saying, if you're used to other coin games, it might be a bit challenging to get into this one because you have to break a bit of a few of your habits. Um, so yeah, maybe not the best, um, maybe not the best entry point, but to that point. I still, for me, it's still the best one. <laughs> like I think the that that layer of complexity is adding so much to the story. Like it's 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 saying so much about the event that I find it fascinating. Um, and I, I really like the analogy with the uh, the Holy Roman Empire. It shows the 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 spatial complexity politics. It was the same in Europe. It was the same in Japan. And you get a better sense of what that means on the ground when you have to do a kinetic war, for example, or when you have to uh, manage an insurrection. I think this is fascinating, and I've rarely seen that in in, in, in war games. Then there is this whole peasant economy that is in its own thing that works very differently than any other coin games. Like, the economy is very different, uh, and I, f I feel it's great. So to back to Joe's point, if, you're, if you have an interest in, in medieval Japan and in, in that period of time, that's going to be for sure the best point of entry because the care that has been put into addressing the subject, the way the game approaches it, what it says about the the era is just really a fascinating stuff. I was interested in Japan, I didn't know that period, and I learned so much just through the process of seeing Joe design it, um, uh, helping I, as I could during the, the some parts of the development. I learned a lot, I read some stuff, and it was really a fascinating way to explore that part of history. But yeah, I, I think it's not the easiest way to get in. I think we have to be, <laughs> to be fair about that, yeah. One one final thing I do want to say is that I I think sometimes the complexity of the coin series as a whole is is really overstated. Um, so you know they're not simple games, but they're not like if you're comfortable if if you're new to war games and comfortable playing heavy Euro games and like happy to give it a try, um, it, it isn't it isn't that difficult. Um, so so this so if if you're not even interested in getting into a series particularly, but there's one topic that interests you, um, this is going to be you'll you know there's there's some new concepts you'll need to know to learn. Um, but they're, they're not really that difficult. And this is the same for people who are maybe used to really heavy hex and counter games um, and then bounce off coin. It's There's new stuff you need to learn, but I, I don't think it's as complicated as people sometimes say it is, I guess I'd say. Yeah, but I think it's it really depends on your perspective. If we talk about complexity, yeah. I agree with Joe that there is a lot of people who play heavy Euros and they don't realize how much they could get into coin games or 18xx game without... With, with a lot less challenge than what they expect. They are, they are, they are, their brain has been trained to do this. Like they know how to do those things. It's just a bit different, but actually they would manage a lot better than what they expect. Yeah, that's right. And that's, you know, people sometimes come and say, which coin game should I play first? And I, I think really, really the answer is always whichever one you're most interested in, because that's going to carry oh. forward. And that probably goes for war games more, more generally or for history games, but really if, if, if there's a topic that you really want to learn about, and that's going to be the best way to get into these games. Um, yeah. I, I know what Fred going to say. So he's talking about class, class war games, which is a group in London uh, from a kind of um, Marxist or kind of socialist perspective playing playing war games uh, and they're interested in these things. And they tried to play Red Flag over Paris recently, and he's going to say they found it really difficult because uh, actually Marxists yeah. aren't that smart. <laughs> so that's that's maybe f that's fair uh but no it's just that people who don't necessarily play as much as we do i think we have a distorted view of what is complex or not um and and, and that's I, I, I think that's the thing and we we need to remember that like we get into some games and we're like oh that's not that complex like because we've played more complex game or just because 
we've played so many games that are quite of similar that we yes. almost instinctively uh, figure out the rules um, when we get to play a, a new coin game or a new war game. And when you so have I mean, to yep. teach someone from scratch how a CDG works, which is yes. like you've played Twilight Struggle, you go into Red Flag or Paris, it's like, poof, like you don't even have to yep. think too much about it. You're just thinking about the small variants. When you've never played a card driven game and you have to explain, so this is ups and this is the event <laughs> and this event has a color and it, depending on the color you can play it or not it's like and you are like what this is insane <laughs> like and and you have to get there it's like for a lot of people that's already a lot of information like when you play like twilight struggle for the first time you're like like your brain explodes I'm, never I'm, I'm still like that anytime like, every yeah. time i play twilight struggle that's my brain but this, this is why i was very careful this is why i was very careful to say it's not that complex insofar as somebody who's used to heavy heavy euro games might might be yeah. able to uh, quite easily pick it up um right. I, I just think people people get kind of scared off these things and they're not they're not not that complex at all. So, yeah. but yes certainly if you've only played lighter games or you're you know only played more traditional card games then it's going to be harder to learn any of your game that's, that's certainly true definitely but, both of your games that we've already talked about um, are topics and themes that I find interesting and probably a lot of people would find interesting. Robin Hood and Japanese historical themes, like you were saying. So that's good news for both of them. Yeah. So let's move on to your other game that you're working on, Joe, uh, Resisting Revolution. So it's an expansion to Cuba Libre. Why after all these years, return to Cuba Libre? <laughs> so it's it's an interesting question, and it, um, it will actually go back to something else me and Fred did when we first uh, know each other. Um, and this this really started, this whole project really started with me just enjoying tinkering with games. And this is even before I started working as a game developer or started really designing my own games much. Um, and, you know, even going back 20 years to when I was much younger, I, I've always enjoyed tinkering with games, um, you know, sort of t taking a game and making it different. Um, I even used to look at some game like adverts in magazines and try to work out how to make the game work because you know I couldn't afford to get it, so I just I just make the rules up myself. Um, and then coming to things like Cuba Libre, when I started playing the coin series, I just began tinkering again and coming up with little mini games using the components um, and this kind of stuff. And one of these I started working on with a good friend of uh, ours, Sean O'Keefe, um, and we together over quite a short period, um, maybe. You know, two, one or two weeks came up with this mini game about the the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba using uh, some of the components, but with some some new cards. Um, and we 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 worked on that together. And that that mini game, which is included in the expansion, actually um, prompted uh, me and Fred and Sean to run this um, Consum game jam back in twenty twenty um, together twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah, something like this. Um, which was to get other people in making these games and. One of the winners of that game is on the shelf behind me, Fijian Agara, um, which started kind of as a hack of uh, Gandhi, so so using the map of India and some of the pieces and moving them around. Um, so that's really how I got into working on Cuba Libre, to answer your question, in, in a roundabout way. And having done that first mini game, I started tinkering with some more pieces, so making a, a variant for the base game, um, this, this, this free player variant, which um, isn't, isn't trying to fix the game, but it's kind of taking a different approach to it. and um you know do, doing some different things with it um and then also working on this main uh, sequel expansion so thinking about the history immediately after the cuban revolution and what what happened then and some of the tensions leading up through the bay of pigs invasion to the cuban missile crisis just looking at this kind of really critical period in the history of the kind of new cuban state um and yeah just just thanks my ideas there so so really um it's not so it's not um you know, it's not an accident that it's Cuba Libre because that's a game and a period of history I was particularly interested in. But it, it really just started from me tinkering with it and then thinking, how can we make this expansion work? Um, and I, I've been working on um, the Fall of Saigon expansion at the same time. So that's one of the first projects at GMT I started working on. Um, so that, that, that made it clear to me that, that we could do these expansions for coin games. Um, and yeah, then over a few years, I just started putting the different bits together. And um started working on it a bit with uh, Stephen Brangazas, who helps me a lot with a lot of my designs. He's a very sharp thinker. And he, he convinced me that it, it was working OK. Um, then I had to do a lot more research and dig in and find out you know, what, what, I, what, I, what I didn't know. And I'm still doing a lot of that research, to be honest. So, so the game's a little bit in a state of flux. 
and we're hoping to start playtesting soon, but there's some things I've been updating as I, as I learn more about the period and about the history uh, okay. to get in there. Um, but as, as I hinted at there, it's actually three games in, in one. So you've got this very tiny game about the Bay of Pigs, which um, me and Sean made together. And then this this free player variant for the original Cuba Libre game, which also comes with some new events. Um, and this is something that uh, Stephen gave me the idea for too, from um, his expansion Sovereign of Discord, also on the shelf behind me, um, for Fire Emblem Lake, uh, which um, brought some new events to Fire Emblem Lake, kind of based on scholarship and thinking, which had come out since the game was published. So um, that you know, Cuba Libre was published nearly ten years ago now. And, and that, that seemed like a similar opportunity for me to read some, some books which have come out since then, think about some of the recent scholarship on the Cuban Revolution, and include some things which maybe didn't fit into the, the main game. Um, and this is a bit similar to Fred in, uh, introducing new cards to Red Flag Over Paris, really. So, you know, there's, there's always stuff which there's not room for in the original game. Um, and I'm sure, sure Volko and uh, Jeff would agree. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's it, really, just to, to bring some new things in and, and, and some new ideas. Um, and it, so it, it can also be seen maybe as almost like a reward or, or a thank you to some of the fans over the years who, who bought the game and supported the series. So uh, people who, who really enjoy Cuba Libre and have been playing it for 10 years, that they can now have a way to kind of revisit it with some, some new content there. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Cuba Libre is one of the few coin games I've actually played, so I'm excited to see cool. how it goes. It's one of the best, so that's a yeah, it's a good one. That's a good one to to play. I really like Cuba Libre. It's uh yeah, I think it's an amazing game, and so it has a lot more depth than people expect. Like you can do so much stuff with it. It's it's really an interesting yeah. game. Yeah. yeah, I mean this is so this is another. So Fred was talking about Andean Abyss earlier, and you know working on this Cuba Libre game and some of the Fire in the Lake stuff. Gone back to Andean Abyss and uh, distant plane as well, uh, just to look at some of the earlier coin designs and, and think about some ideas which we maybe forgot or kind of left behind. And, and there's certainly stuff in these early designs which is worth worth going back to. So, you know, it isn't like they were they're kind of worse earlier ones. I think there's, there's some really interesting things in those which which are kind of valuable to, to readers. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Maybe some future projects there. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned the Consum Game Jam. Just out of curiosity, do you have... A plan for when to do it again? I was pretty confident we would do one in 2023, but uh, life has been a bit more complicated than what I expected, uh, so it it didn't become uh, as possible as what I uh, as what I wanted. But I do expect that in 2024 we'll have another session. Uh, that means that the, the 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 event will officially become a once every other year event, which I think <laughs> is probably uh, is probably for the best. So every uh, every two years we'll have one, and I think the first one was in late 2020. So late 2020 right. was Quantum Game Jam 1, 2022 number 2, and we'll have in 2024 the number 3. And maybe if the new team that is put together for the uh, the, the edition 3 feels very confident, then we go, go back to a yearly basis, but that, that will not be thanks to me. That would be thanks to those people who um, uh, get better organized and, 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 and we manage this a, a, a way a lot better than, than I would. Uh, but yeah, the idea of the Consim Game Jam was really to get um, more people into game design um, in a different fashion than what an event like the Zenobia Awards uh, is doing. I think what Zenobia is doing is, is quite amazing work. They're really thinking about the type of people that we're getting into game design, which I think is a, a, a great uh, idea. Um, honestly, I didn't think about this <laughs> because I'm a bit stupid. I thought about just, oh, it's funny to make games in just a few days and to show to people how easy it is actually um, uh, to, to just engage with the hobby. It doesn't mean that um, uh, making a game is not hard. It's actually extremely hard. And in a lot of ways, it's more yeah. of a, a marathon than a sprint. Uh, but I think, I, think, I think what it shows you is it's easy to, to get to started. Start making a game. To, yeah. you know, stop. If you have some ideas, you can just spend 24 hours putting the ideas down, testing them a bit, going on. But then once you have an idea which is working, as, as we all know, it's going to take months more, years more mm -hmm. to actually get it finished and, and published and everything. But I think this first stage is what, pe will, yeah. what people are blocked by. They think they are not creative. They think they cannot do it. Yeah. it they think it's, it's beyond what they could be able to. And I don't think that's true. I really believe that as long as you play 
uh, historical games and you engage with them seriously and you really understand how they work once you play them, there is nothing that stops you from starting designing ones. And I think a lot of people have a lot of different and interesting stories to tell and just showing to people, well, the step is not that high. You can get there. Not lying about the fact that it's actually quite hard afterwards like that's also something that we're very transparent with the participants afterwards like your games at the end might be funny and everything but if you want to then make them actual game you're starting a process that is actually radically different and this is where the Zenobia awards is really great because they actually help the contestants through the whole process what what i wanted to do is just something that is really showing people you can get in there and do something interesting in just three days and i and, and we can like uh, bust a few myths, myths about uh, what is making a game and having people coming in so they can hear from uh, other designers, they can get, hear from graphic designers, they can hear from developers, and they can better understand what is the process behind a game and everything. And in a lot of ways, it's also value, It's also creating more value of our work uh, when we're designing and developing games. Because when once you do it, you better understand the work that comes behind it, the care that you have to put in, in, into it. Because at the same time, it's not that hard to get started and make a game. But sometimes I, I think that on the other side, people don't realize how much of extra work do you need to make a commercially um, uh, a commercial game? Like how much care you need to put into it? How much reflection you need to put behind the event that you were uh, the research to portray the event in a proper way? Playing with history is not uh, something to yeah. to look at uh, carelessly. And I think it's yeah, it's at the same time showing how easy it can be, but also how serious it can be. And I, I think this is what I like about the event. And we've seen great games coming out of them. I'm super excited about seeing uh, uh, quite a few of them being released by uh, GMT in a shape or another. Uh, and another one is going to be uh, announced by Wellegig. Uh, so one of the finalists of the mm -hmm. edition two is, is picked up by uh, by Wellegig. So I'm also pretty excited about this. And yeah, it's really fun to see those games come into uh, come yeah coming to the to, yeah to the to the market and, and having players engaging with other games. And I think the kind of people that we attracted through that event might be a bit different than traditional uh, war game circles. Like you have, I think we did manage to get some people who have different stories to tell, which was something that was also quite important for me. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy to see uh, how it's going to evolve. But uh, for it to work, <laughs> we need other people than me uh, to actually make those things. Uh, yeah. 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 It's surprising we had to organize a very short three day um, online thing like this. Uh, I'd say. Yeah. 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 But he hearing you say all that, Fred, I think really what we should say about this is what it shows you is it's easy to design a game, but it's hard to develop a game. And all the hard yes. work really is done behind the developers. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're, you're saying this as a trap, or, or, or uh, but I agree. I've always agreed. <laughs> I I think that, yeah. There is some truth to it. And I think that a, a lot of people underestimate this. And I would say, I don't want to be mean to anyone. I'm not going to say any, any name, but I also think that some publishers don't realize that. And that's one of the problems. And one of the things that I like about GMT, that GMT realizes that having the ideas is one thing, and that's great, but the hard work is actually developing those ideas into good games. And this is where a lot of the work is happening. Like, you cannot just... Uh, uh, come up with a great idea, like making a coin game about Robin Hood. Cool, that's a cool idea. Making it a cool game, th that's a lot of work. Uh, and and yeah, and I think that's uh, that's that's quite important. And that's a lot of development. That's a lot of refinement. That's a lot of thinking around how do people learn games? How can we make this as accessible as possible? A lot of testing to make sure that everything works properly. A lot of thinking around how. What are the different nouns that make sense in the game? What are the different verbs? Like really thinking about like design as a as a mechanical system, but also making it approachable uh, to 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 players. It's a yeah, it's a, it's a quite a hard craft making games, I think. Definitely, and I want to ask because both of you have designed and developed games. So, do you prefer one over the other? Uh, do you feel like you would like to do both, or or what? So maybe I will reply first before Joe becomes mean to me. So I will I will preempt anything. So I am definitely not a developer. Uh, I know I'm going to be credited uh, developer on two games from GMT, uh, but I don't think that's a fair statement. Uh, so I will be on the Pure Land and I will be on Baltic Empires uh, uh, from uh, Brian Escobar. Uh, the reason I'm on the first one, the Pure Land, is uh, because 
when um, uh, Joe was being added to P500, uh, he needed uh, a developer and Steven wasn't available at that time. So I jumped in because I, I was like, well, Joe, I don't want to leave you alone and I want to be here and support you because I love this game so much. But I knew I wouldn't be able to do much. Like I could uh, reread the rules, do some play tests, do some stuff, maybe run a few statistics. I did some analysis of the victory condition and help uh, uh, define the threshold because everything that is around statistics is going to be something that I'm more comfortable with. Uh, so doing a few stuff, but the hard work of the, which it means like doing the events, making sure that they are properly balanced, making sure that they are properly written, that you're consistent in the language and everything. I'm not a native speaker, and even if I was, like I'm not very, uh, a very, like my mind is not really. It's not straight, like uh, let, let's say that it's like that, and and I'm awful for this. And a lot of the a lot of the work and thinking about how you explain things, how you write things, how you make the system as efficient as possible is not really my strong suit. And for the pure land, like my my involvement was more almost more of a cheerleader than anything, and doing a bit of stats on the on the side. And and for and for Baltic empires. Um, the thing is that I had a really close, I have a really close relationship with Brian Askelev. So as I said, when I was living in Denmark, I was playing with Brian on every week. Every week we were playing together, and most of the time playing uh, playtesting design that he was working on. Um, and he's really the person that got me into game design, convinced me that I could make a game, and really helped me in my first steps. And um, and the thing is for Baltic Empires been working with him for quite a while um and it was one of those games that he had in uh like in, in his drawers and i really felt like there was a, a potential for it it was a topic that he was passionate about and i thought he was um uh, trying to sell it to the wrong publisher basically and i convinced him you know what let's rethink uh this game let's make it different than what it is now and let's work together on 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 making it a GMT game, something that would make sense uh, for for the GMT line. And my involvement here was more a sparring partner for the design side of things. Most of the game was already there, but I helped him refine a lot of the design aspects, uh, how the dramatis personae works, quite a few things here and there to make it more distinctive and and have a more unique flavor to it. And I really helped him in that regard. And then making the TTS module painfully and those kind of stuff. But then as soon as it beca became the real development work of taking this game and make it as good as possible, this is where like Joe stepped in and Joe is a co-developer for it. And like what he's doing on, on, on Baltic Empires, I wouldn't be able to. And you wouldn't me want me to, to do it because if I did, the game would be... Would, it would be, a, you know, when your reviewers say there is a good game in there, but... I, it requires too much work from from the from the from the players to actually figure it out, and and this is this is where where Joe comes in. So so Fred's very clear that he was designing, I think, in, in some sense. Although he said I was going to be mean to him, and I actually think um, he's being too mean to himself because lots of what you're describing there, so being a sparring partner early on and thinking through some of the ideas and so on, is is what development's about. Um, it's just that it's 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 a very complex role with a lot of different things going on. Yeah. Um, so both both you and Stephen, I think, work with me more in this kind of refining ideas and and working on basic concepts. Bit. And then, I mean, that's what I do as well as a developer. And then there's this other stuff later on. So a lot of fine attention to detail, making sure it's easy to learn, making sure it's all correct and these kinds of things. And that that's uh, quite a different kind of work in a way. And that's also what I do. Um, but but you're, you're, you're certainly good at some parts of that. Um, so don't, don't cut yourself too, too short on that, I'd say. Um, but, you know, in terms of what I prefer doing, I, there's, there's a sense in which I do prefer developing. Um, but I think it's, it's almost for slightly, uh, cowardly reasons or kind of lack of confidence reasons but it's 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 a lot safer to be working on someone else's games and and, and you feel a lot less vulnerable um but at the same time i i also really enjoy just the the craft of making things easy to understand and easy to learn and and, and read well and just just work properly and um, that's something i realized in my old work so i used to be um an academic and i i realized at some point that i really enjoyed working with other people when i was working on a project because i could um make it work well and i didn't necessarily enjoy so much coming up with the 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 new idea in the first place and i i think um you know that that leads quite naturally to me working now primarily as a developer because i can i can take a project and you know make it really come together well like like fred's saying so make it something which which is easy to use and and um Fits, fits together well and and that's something which i i find a real joy in doing whereas uh you know while i enjoy designing as well 
it's, it's a lot harder and a lot uh, tougher for me in a way to come up with the new ideas and to really own them and to feel that kind of vulnerability to do them. So I, I take more naturally to developing in a way, but I've, you know, I, I still really enjoy doing doing the design work and that's, that's a very exciting thing to do. It's it's probably also true to say that with, with some designers and some developers, it, it's much closer to a co-design kind of project. So Stephen, who, who I work with a lot, um, really prefers to think of it that, that way. I think Fred does sometimes as well. But when when you're working very closely with somebody, it's it's almost like you're you're co-designing it. You have slightly different roles on the project. What future GMT related projects are you working on, if any, that you want to talk about? So, Joe, you're working on future stuff. Thinking uh, about. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, um, he's actually working on 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 stuff that might be added to P500 uh, at some point, I guess. Right? Yeah, I think yeah, you're, you're at least, yeah, yeah, you are. I'm ready on P500. Um, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I have, so I have a few designs already done, which which could conceivably. So I have um, um, another game in the in the Final Crisis series. Um, so Fred's uh, kind of following Fred's red flag over Paris and quite close to that design in some respects. But it's about an even more obscure event. Um, it's actually about an event which is took place exactly 50 years after the Paris Commune. And uh, some of the imagery around it called back to the Paris Commune. So it was um, a revolt on Kronstadt naval base outside St. Petersburg during the Russian Revolution, um, where a group of um, maybe anarchists and other kind of anti-Bolshevik um, figures um, rebelled against the, the Bolsheviks. And they'd, they'd previously been allied with the Bolsheviks. So it has a similar feel to, to Red Flag over Paris insofar as there is this uprising during a period of revolution and, and there's the tension and the turmoil and it's it's an event I, I find very interesting and I think lots of people who have learned about it find interesting. It's it's seen sometimes as a turning point in the Russian Revolution um where uh it, it started clamping down on internal dissent. Um so there was a lot of other people and factions involved in the revolution maybe prior to this. And this is really at least in some people's minds when the Bolshevik said, you know, this is this is going to be our revolution done our way and and stamped down on these things. Or if you ask more, more sympathetic people when they uh, started having to deal with um, internal troublemakers who were just certain things and so on. But anyway, it's 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 at the very least a very interesting turning point in the same way that the Paris Commune is. Um, so yeah. that's that's something which I've worked on and that's kind of a fully fleshed out design. There's a question mark about how how well a game like that would do on the market. I think, but that that's something mm -hmm. I've I've finished working on. Um, I'm very interested in doing some designs about. Uh, other kinds of social unrest. So kind of going back to the, my interest in these in these peasant uprisings, but looking at things like um, 19th and 20th uh, century workers' movements, so so strikes and things like this. And I've done some research into the um, miners' strikes in the UK in the 1980s. That's something I'm very interested in. But again, quite um, a, a kind of tricky topic to, to, to a wider audience, I think. So I have a tendency, Fred does too, to pick some quite obscure topics when we're designing, um, I'd say. Um, probably, probably Robin Hood was a rare exception for Fred. Hmm. Um, are there other designs I've I've worked on, Fred? I'm forgetting. No, I I think that's pretty much it. Uh, um, oh, I have a half baked I have a half baked coin design on the um, Scottish War of Independence. So, um, yeah, William yeah, Wallace, this, all, the, all that the, kind of yeah, stuff. But, this uh, yeah. this one has been a while. Yeah. I, and I think it uh, might fit better uh, uh, Livian campaign. Uh, oh, no. And I have a Livian campaign design. Yes. Now it's all coming yeah. out. Um, yeah, yeah. I do have another half-baked Levian campaign design on the wars of Oda Nobunaga uh, at the end of the uh, kind of warring states period in Japan. And that design, um, which I, I would like to do at some point, would really bookend the Pure Land. So it's a different system, but another system designed by Dr. Runke. Um, and it comes at the far end. So... The main one of the main themes of the Pure Land is this Buddhist uprising um, against the state and and so on. And then, hundred years later, Nobunaga, who ends up kind of kind of unifying Japan, uh, his his last major enemy is this same Buddhist sect, who have since then become really powerful. They have castles and fortresses and so on, and big armies. Um, and it would be his his war against them. So it, it it would really be the kind of other end of of story of um of the Ikawiki of the, the true Pure Land sect in in Japan. So that, that's one I would I would quite like to work mm. on at some point. Yeah, it's hard to find time. Yeah, hard to find time. Jason Carr is even worse for this than I am. But when you develop, you know, ten plus games, it's it's hard to find time for your own design work sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It'd be I cool to be uh, play a full campaign, jump from coin, yep. your land, to then levy. Yeah, 
that. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to uh, cover a long period of time just with a series of games that go across different series of um, like different systems. I think it could be really fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. And no, I think that's it. That's the only thing that I can think about that you're working on. Um, on my side, I I know I would like to make um, uh, another game with uh, GMT. And usually the games that I do with GMT, I want them to be games that matter to me. So I want them to talk about something that is important to me, games that I think that probably that I feel like I need to make. Um, but the thing is that I've been thinking about a couple of uh, different topics that I would like to approach. Um, not all of them necessarily obscure, some more obscure than others, that's for sure. Uh, there is a game that has been on my mind for quite some time that is um, uh, taking some elements of uh, the PAX series, but ad adapting it to um, uh, uh, like integrating other aspects, but uh, uh, taking a lot of these ideas to cover the collapse of the USSR. So um, to start at the mm -hmm. death of Andropov, uh, the whole uh, period of Gorbachev, and then uh, the, the the first tenure of um, uh, Boris Yeltsin up until the 1996 election that he almost wo lost against the communist candidate. So covering those um, uh, 13, 14 years in the middle. Uh, and I think there is a, a very interesting story to tell. And I think a story that nobody's really covering about what it means for a country to become capitalist and the level of violence that comes with it, but also talk about the collapse of a system that uh, of of one of the biggest socialist experiment that we had that was ultimately a failure. So talking about that failure, but also the violence of, of introducing capitalism into a society uh, and what does it mean for the people who are making money out of it, uh, basically. So maybe uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a bit of a, a darker economic topic that will have some ties in a way with um, uh, in the spirit with games like John Company and, and stuff like this, like talking about greed and in the wider impact that it can have on societies. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm thinking about and I've been thinking about for quite some time. Um, then there is, I would like to explore a bit more of French colonial history. Uh, and I've been thinking about this and I don't really know necessarily how I want to make it. And I don't think it would be a coin game. But uh, there is two topics that I would like to think about. Uh, one of them is uh, the war in Algeria. But if I do something about the war in Algeria, I would like to focus on specific aspects of the conflict. Uh, and there is two aspects that I'm really interested in. One is the Battle of Algiers, which I think is um, just a fascinating topic because of the movie, because of uh, uh, urban insurgency, and also to depict um, the um, the. Uh, the culture of torture that was within the French military and how they used it. Uh, and I think it might reveal a lot of the things about uh, also American uh, uh, torture systems uh, that we've seen in uh, in Abu Ghraib and and, uh, and 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 places like this. So I think that would be interesting to explore. And then the other aspect of um, of uh, the um, war in Nigeria that I'm interested in is the diplomatic uh, side of it. I think it's something that is uh, often overlooked and in a lot of ways you can say that it's probably an insurrection that won on the diplomatic level, which is quite interesting, especially uh, on the light of, of events that are happening right now in Israel and Palestine and the, the importance of the diplomatic aspect of it uh, in some in some aspects. Uh, you think that potentially the way forward, sometimes not necessarily on the ground, but uh, the pressure that might come from the outside uh, on countries that um, uh, practice colonialism. So I think there is this. And then um, there is another topic that is even closer to me because I have family ties with it, and that's uh, the war in Indochina. Uh, and I think there is one aspect of Indochina that I find quite interesting and that I would like to explore, which is the end of the war of Indochina. So the, when uh, the French are moving back and when the decision is made that the trade-off between how much wealth we can extract from that territory and from those people and how much does it cost to stay is not worth it anymore. And uh, the relationship between um, uh, the industrial, the, the, like the industrial class and, 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 uh, and the French state on how much should you invest to actually retain a territory that is not worth it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And I already have an idea for a title that is based on a, on a French book which is called Une Sortie Honorable, which talk, talks about it, so an honorable exit. Uh, and I think that would be a, an interesting topic. But yeah, I don't know what could be the system of it. I was thinking about um, uh, having a CDG kind of system, and I was potentially thinking about maybe uh, using some of, like making something in the series of small struggle uh, games. 
but it's very i'm very unsure about all of this so those are the the few things that i'm thinking about oh and there is one other thing that i'm thinking about that is more funny and because it's funny it might be the one that i'm doing next i think around <laughs> 10 years ago um uh, around 10 years ago nuts publishing released a small um uh, uh, um oh, yeah. a ziploc game uh, called Les Guerres Picrocolines, the Picrocoline Wars, which was a medieval war game uh, set in the universe of Pantagruel et Gargantua et Pantagruel, so uh, a, a famous uh, medieval uh, novel from uh, Rabelais that was uh, quite important. And they made this hex encounter about a war that happens in the book called Les Guerres Picrocolines, which is quite humoristic, uh, a bit uh, crazy. There are giants a lot of uh, wine drinking and a lot of like the the war is is a stupid war uh, fought over some vineyard and something like this and i like this hex and counter game because it's it's talking about a topic that is uh, a bit unusual and in a lot of ways like uh horror movies today are talking about our society in a different way the the the, the book by rabelais was talking about french society of the time in a humoristic way using metaphors and stuff like this and i think it's quite interesting because in a lot of ways it, it is talking about history and, and, and this and i thought what would be funny was would be to use those elements to make a, a very introductory game into the Livian campaign system, um, mm -hmm. which I thought would be really funny. So once again, using some literary work to introduce people to a, a very famous uh, GMT series, which might become my trademark or something like this. I think it could be fun. But I think there is definitely something funny to do about this. The problem is that I'm not sure how commercially viable it is. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know, but I think it would be just fun to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so those are the few ideas that I'm uh, like tinkering uh, with in my mind. Some of them already have some concepts and some writing and some research behind them. Others are just ideas that I'm thinking about. And it's really hard for me to know what should be the next one. But yeah, I definitely want to do more games with GMT. I want to do more games about um, different aspects of history that we don't necessarily think about. And uh and yeah, but I, I don't know. And I guess that Joe will help me figure out what I should do. And uh, yeah. well, this is there's, there's a common theme of some of our ideas for what we want to work on, which is that they're so obscure that they might not be viable. And <laughs> yes. I, think, I think there's a bit of a tension here because both of us like to explore these these more unusual topics, and I think that's like an important and interesting thing to do. But it can be hard sometimes to work out how to bring those to people. Um, but I have the answer, which is that you just need to become an even more famous uh, internet sensation, Fred. Um, then <laughs> just yeah. just your face on the box will 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 sell the game, and, yeah. and that's what we'll need to do. Is we'll need to start putting. You know, as, as seen, seen on, on YouTube, on yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> seen on YouTube, yeah, yeah, yeah that would but... be uh, that would be nice, uh, yeah. But I don't know. In a way, you know, when I when I pitched uh, Red Flag of a Paris to GMT, like it was really obscure. I didn't think that GMT would be interested. And one thing, GMT got interested. And the second thing is that people ended up buying the game. So you know, it's also a matter of um, uh, making the industry interesting to people. I think. Uh, and in that regard, I guess that the GMT audience is pretty open to those things, to those unexpected topics and everything. And of course, those are not going to be the big, uh, like the big, uh, you're going to have not, not great printing numbers. You're not going to make the biggest GMT games with those kind of topics. But it's cool to see that GMT is actually, um, uh, first of all, open to those topics. But also that they that uh, as a company, GMT manages to make those uh, topics appealing to uh, to audiences that might not know much about uh, through inside GMT, through making videos, but also also making sure that the the games come with content that make the the, the topic um, um, more accessible with playbooks and 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 historical notes behind the cards and everything. So I think there is still opportunities. Maybe some of them might be too obscure and fair enough, but I think like uh, some stuff about the war in Algeria or the war in China is definitely is definitely manageable. Yeah, those all sound really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing those in the future, maybe. And <laughs> uh, we're almost out of time, but before we let you go, we have a couple more questions. All right. So the first one: Do you each have a favorite game that's by another GMT designer? And you can say each other if you want. Well, Fred's Fred already said that my game is his favorite. So, okay. that's, so that's you're done. done. I, said, I, I, I said it was my favorite coin game. Um, yes, that's true. Yeah. I don't know what's my favorite GMT game overall. Uh, well, I'm gonna and I'm gonna add another rule for myself as well that it can't be a game I've developed. No, it's gonna be a game that's, that's almost that's almost a co-design kind of. It needs to be so. released and that you haven't yes. and that you haven't developed and or designed. Yep. yep. 
yeah. so adding rules to the rules. Uh, what is the? Wait a minute. I'm I'm gonna look at the game that I play the most. Uh, give me a second. I'm I'm gonna have a a, a small look at board game geek here. Uh, I'm gonna look at my <laughs> profiles. Um, the thing is that Ready the Troops uh, skewed those results quite significantly. Yep. Because I think mm. if I look at Ready the okay. Troops, probably the game that I play the most will either be um, uh, Time of Crisis or uh, <laughs> Time of Crisis or um, or Undead Abyss. So I'm not sure yeah. that might be. Uh, well, yeah. Well, Fred looks. So I'll I'll throw out two two ideas uh, for me, and because it's you know it's hard to pick a favorite because there's so many good ones. Um, one I've been playing a lot recently, uh, and I, I think is really great, is uh, Space Corp by John John Butterfield. And mm -hmm. I particularly like this one because it's it's a game by GMT that, that I can introduce to quite a wide range of people, and I can you know anyone who's played more kind of um, regular board games, uh, you know modern board games, will, will very easily be able to pick it up. Uh, but it's you know it's a very sharp design with a lot of really interesting space to it. So I'm 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 going to go with that for, for today. Um, yeah, yeah. and I would yep. say that um, surprisingly, the game that I played the most that is actually not on Ready the Troops, and that is a game that my partner is obsessed by, that I love, and I think it's one of the most unusual but one of the best GMT games. It's actually Battle Line, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and I think Great that game. Battle Line is so good, like it is so good. It is an amazing game, uh, but maybe on the more uh, serious uh, side of things. Uh, I don't know if maybe I don't know how I feel about mentioning uh, the British way. Um, you can do that. You can do that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm still I'm 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 on the the booklet for the credits. I'm. Uh, I think, That's a special, I, think I, have, special I, I have I have to be. Yeah, honestly, I think it might it might be Twilight Struggle. Like it's one of the mm -hmm. games that I played the most that got me into historical gaming and war gaming in general. I. Each time I replay it, uh, I am always amazed by the sharpness of the design, about the story that it tells. I think that Twilight Struggle is is like my first love, and it will always be there. Uh, it will always be in my collection. Yeah, that's good. If I was going to go for a second, you know, slightly more traditional, heavier GMT game, I'd probably go for Sekigahara, which yeah. is you know it's of a of a theme I'm very interested in. But again, it's just an extremely sharp and precise design which which i think does does everything very well so just from a kind of design perspective i think it's a it's a, it's a really great game really interesting it's almost yeah. an abstract i think uh yeah on, yeah but a it's, lot of it's, it's a nice yeah. it's it, it's a good example of how to use quite simple simple mechanisms to in a very effective and compelling way to, to tell a story i'd say yeah. yeah and also amazing game yeah those are great choices so thanks for sharing those and uh another question we like to ask is who are uh, one or two people in the hobby who've had a positive influence on your growth and development in the hobby as a game designer, as a developer, whatever you want? And and let's not just say each other, Fred. That's too. Yeah. That's too, no, but, uh, but that's too sweet. sweet. Yeah, I, I think Joe is is definitely the most important. But uh, beyond that, I think that for me, Stephen Ranganzas uh, was that was going to be that was going to be my pick too, Fred. And it's going to be also Joe's pick. Uh, and, and then on more traditional level, I think that um, uh, Volko is has always been uh, super welcoming, super uh, helpful for new designers, always very supportive. And I think that Volko is really the kind of people that 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 makes it also possible to to explore new topics and helps uh, new designers. Uh, and yeah, I think that for that, Volko is uh, is amazing. Uh, Herman in a very, uh, uh, Mark Herman in a very uh, different style, like a bit more, <laughs> uh, a bit more of a bully, but still uh, hiding, a, 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 I think a big heart, uh, a very uh, kind man, very supportive. Um, and also he created so many great templates uh, for us to work with as, as designer. He opened the way of so many things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Brian Train, like um, I think when I first designed Red Flag Over Paris and I was announced on P GMT's P500, it was great to have someone like Brian that I was looking up to, reaching out spontaneously to me and 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 like encouraging me in my uh, in my endeavor and 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 starting a, a relationship like uh, directly in one to one. And I thought that meant a lot. Uh, and I think Brian was 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 quite a big thing for that. And then one final person that I think everyone would agree is extremely kind and extremely supportive and just a bit annoying by how productive a designer he is. Uh, but that's David Thompson. I think mm -hmm. David Thompson, even though it's like the, it's not really, he's part of the GMT family, though. He has, yes, uh, he is now. He, he has, he is now. Uh, we've, he is we've, now. we've got him. 
Yeah, yeah, we got him. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, but but yeah, I think that um, uh, David's kindness, uh, but also beyond just game design and and like for other more personal stuff, he's always been here. Uh, he's always um, someone who's here to to listen and support. I think those those people are are people that make the hobby extremely welcoming and and super uh, uh, collaborative for 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 designers. I think they are yeah they are amazing people. I mean, so I yeah I I go with all of those. Um, I'll I'll emphasize Stephen again just because he's somebody who I work so closely with and has been a huge influence on me. Um, I think he's just an incredibly sharp designer when it comes to historical games, and he's really helped with all, all of my own designs, solving many problems, and just coming up with excellent ideas. And he's he's also just a really interesting person to talk to about all, all kinds of different things. Um, but one other person I want to mention is Jason Carr, who brought me into this work in the first place, mm -hmm. and has just been incredibly supportive as a as a mentor and as a friend. And I you know I, I talked to Jason almost as much as I talked to Fred, and uh, yeah, he's really a fantastic person um, and very kind and uh, supportive to to me and many other people. So. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks for shouting those people out. We like to spread the love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have today for GMT Talk. Thank you guys, uh, Joe and Fred, for taking the time to talk with us and being guests. And thank you very much for having us. It was a great chat and actually quite fun. unusual questions from uh, from mm -hmm. other sessions. So it was it was really great. Thanks a lot for having us. Yeah, yeah thanks thank very much. All right, we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.